I'm Chris Burns and welcome to The Network, hard talk with a matrix of newsmakers. The headlines. In the Balkans, a Macedonian government crisis risks turning into an ethnic conflict after Albanian extremists attacked a police station in a deadly firefight. Kosovo is seeing a mass exodus while the economy suffers from government corruption and Serbia refuses to recognize its self-declared independence. In Bosnia, 20 years after Europe's worst conflict since World War II, the peace accord remains tenuous, with Serb, Croat and Muslim leaders refusing to cooperate. One of the winning entries of the Cannes Film Festival examined decades of Balkan conflicts through three love stories. Could the enduring tensions yet explode again? Wired into this edition of the network here at the European Parliament in Brussels, we're connecting with Zagreb actually. Dalibor Matanic, Croatian director of the High Sun, jury prize winner of the Certain Regards section of this year's Cannes Film Festival. Here at the Parliament is Tonino Pizzula, Croatian socialist MEP and chair of the Delegation for Relations with Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo, and Rosa Balfour, senior fellow on the European program of the German Marshall Fund. Fund. Welcome to all of you. Let me start with a question to all of you, starting with Dalibor. How dangerous is the situation in the Balkans? Are we lo still looking now at a Balkan tinderbox? I think it's a uh, key problem is younger generation, you know, they are not affected with war at all, you know, they are like born in 96, 97, but they are born to hate everywhere in each country of ex Yugoslavia, especially now in Croatia, Serbia and Macedonia. So it, it's a huge problem. Okay, uh, Tonino, Tinderbox? Yes, it's a question of the perception, what kind of the perception of the Western Balkans is prevailing today. Of course, it's a, a crisis zone or a potential area. I think that's a 20 years since Dayton Agreement been uh, signed. Of course, it's still an open issue. But this is a unique moment in the Western Balkans history because each respective state are sharing the same foreign policy goals. Mm. It's European Union membership and the vast majority of them, even NATO. Okay, Rosa, they're, they're, they're heading in that direction, but, but there are a lot of bumps in the road at the moment. It's dangerous bumps in the road, no? There are bumps in the road that need to be taken seriously, and the EU needs to take care of them. That is crucial. Um, however, the track is outlined. Um, not all is dangerous. There are some positive developments as well that one needs to take into account. So it's important when looking at the Balkans not to let the noise obscure the real process. Okay, but is the EU doing enough to try to stabilize the situation? Tonino. I think now uh, we need to concentrate on the effect of the, what Mr. Juncker has said about enlargement in the next five years. There will be no enlargement, just servicing the current uh, negotiations of the future membership. I think it's a message directed more to all Europe than to political elite in the Western Balkans, who must not take it as alibi. Now, Dalibor, how, how much uh, have you seen that on the ground, the effect of what the, the uh, Commission has said, that they don't plan on any enlargement over the next five years? You know, the problem in the Balkan region is that history all the time repeats, you know. That's what we are dealing in film, you know, about. And uh, if, uh, if it doesn't go on the level two of the human behavior, I think this history will repeat again. There's a danger, you know, of EU and Balkans, you know. It can be another war, I think. Rosa, do you think that taking the foot off the gas or seeming to take the foot off the gas toward European integration, how damaging has that been to the situation? It, I think it has been damaging. The political message was not a good one. The political message needs to be one of continued commitment um, and engagement with the elites and with the societies in the Balkans. But it is certainly true that none of the Balkan states are ready to join the EU in, in the near future. So it's, it's actually been quite realistic. Saying it was a statement be. of fact, but it was an, un an unnecessary political message, in my view. Okay, so a number of countries involved right now in, in different tensions. Macedonia, the, the, the Macedonian uh, uh, situation, uh, wh what do you think? Is this ethnic card really behind what is going on in the tensions there? Tony, no? One uh, thing I'm sure of today that the uh, name issue is not an obstacle. It's the only obstacle for the Macedonian path towards the European Union. There's a lot of to be done within the Macedonia to improve uh, so many records. So I don't think in the, basically it's an ethnic conflict right now, right? It's a clash between different political options in the Macedonia. Yes, because uh, there's a corruption scandal or there's, or there's a scandal over there over, uh, over surveillance. Um, Dalibor, in, in Croatia, um, we talked about this together. There, 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 it, there's a rise of far-right 
parties there. Is that not right? And you, you see, how much of a danger do you see there? You know, when the economy is poor and when you have like corruption, these kind of things, you know, the nationalism is going up, you know, not just in Balkan region, but in all Europe, I think, in all the world, you know, and the nationalism is the biggest problem in, for each country of Balkan region, you know. This is what, what divides them from European Union. Okay. Rosa, on, uh, quickly on Kosovo, yeah. people fleeing, the government is, is beset with this corruption. Um, how, what should the EU be doing right now? Now, the key, well, first of all, let's not forget that there is a dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade, which is moving forward, and that is the framework for solving the overall problems in the region, at least a large part of them. Uh, so that must not be forgotten. Secondly, the EU needs to focus on the strengthening of democratic institutions. That's the heart of the problem in Macedonia, and that's the heart of the problem in all the countries. Tonino, what about trying to get Serbia to recognize Kosovo? Is that ever going to happen? Of course, it's very tough to speculate uh, when or will Serbia recognize Kosovo. It, it, it seems that uh, it's, a, a, it's a core problem of not one government, but uh, every government in the Serbia. But uh, it's really interesting to uh, follow the negotiations between the Serbia. Don't forget that Serbia did not open any negotiation uh, chapter so far. And chapter 35 is especially interesting because it's uh, relating to the Kosovo future. Okay, so there could be some sort of movement on that. Uh, on Bosnia, now, uh, Dalibor, your film had in some ways, uh, in many ways, to do with, with, with the Bosnian conflict. Um, how uh, optimistic or pessimistic are you about Bosnia? How, uh, you know, how dangerous is that situation? Can you see sort of something being sorted out? Or should there be a split in that country? Because of the nationalism, you know, each country like uh, Croatia, Serbia, Macedonia are building the big walls, you know, like Hungary now. And in Bosnia, you can't build that big walls, but you can destroy all country with, you know, inter walls. I don't know. I think the Bosnia is first a country that must go on this level too. We are talking about with tolerance and, and uh, humanity and compassion, you know, because uh, politically there is no solution for Bosnia. You know, it can be divided, you know, but it will be horrible for the Muslim people. Yes, yes. Rosa, is, is there any talk of... of a de facto, I mean, recognizing the de facto division and saying these, these are two countries. No, I think nobody wants to go down uh, that road. Uh, that would be very dangerous. Uh, so, and, and, and Antonino, what, what do you think? What, what is the, what's the solution here? What should the EU be doing about this? Yeah. Now, it's obvious that the Dayton Accord uh, was an excellent ceasefire document, but very lousy, uh, in a way, a uh, uh, foundation for establishing a functional multi-ethnic state. So I think the future of the Bosnia is a certain in the Europe, and uh, we are looking forward to some uh, notions in the future and moves that will transform Bosnia from Dayton to the Brussels phase. And if you ask me the, the most important thing, which I'm expecting to be uh, overdone in the future, is uh, how to reform constitutional system in the Bosnia it's going. Yeah, and that's, that, that's quite a big bone to pick. What about uh, the Muslim extremist groups that some people talk about, that this certain parts uh, in Bosnia, for instance, uh, are seen as uh, potential places for ISIS and other groups to, to, to recruit people? How much should we be worried about that? I know you're only a filmmaker, Dalibor, but what do you think? You know what's Bosnia? Bosnia is a symbol of ex-Yugoslavia, I you know. It's kind of a multicultural kind of country, you know, that war happened inside, you know, and that's why the biggest horror in ex-war, ex you know, happened in Bosnia, you know. So I think tolerance and uh, kind of dialogue is the most important thing for this country. Rosa, do you think we're doing enough to promote dialogue there? I mean, dialogue between people, not just people at the negotiating table. No, I, I, I do think there's scope for doing much more at the level of societies, at the level of young people, and bringing these societies together with the European ones. One of the biggest uh, uh, initiatives, and most important initiatives that the EU did pursue was visa liberalization. More mobility, more exchanges, more dialogue among people is the way forward. So, you know, this is your job. Yeah. You should be doing more on this, no? Yes, of course, but when we are talking about hot dots in the, in the region, uh, from the Macedonia, Kosovo, and Bosnia, Herzegovina, you know, uh, I think they are interconnected with the so-called so synchronicity of the crisis within the region and outside of the region. So it's a really very comprehensive job for the Brussels and the member states to, let's say, predict what's the feasible and good solutions for the Balkans as well. I think it's European future for, okay. for sure. Tonino, thanks very much. I'd like to thank all of our guests, uh, Dalibor Matanic, Tonino Pitsula, and Rosa Balfour. I'm Chris Burns, and until next time, thanks for connecting with the network.